Dr. Bill Adams here, and this is No Spin Live, and do we have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about the FDA sends warning letters to seven laser companies. A hockey puck ruptures a breast implant. Imagine that. And last, the stresses of social media. And we've got four incredible, talented plastic surgeons to bring you some really great insights. We've got Dr. Charlie Mesa from Weston, Florida. Dr. Dan Del Vecchio from Boston, Massachusetts, in the car. Uh, Dr. Jason Posner from Boca Raton, Florida. And Dr. John Cook from Chicago, Illinois. So this is hot off the press. Yesterday, the FDA issued seven letters to seven laser companies, basically saying that they were doing off-label promotion of a lot of the the vaginal rejuvenation laser energy technologies. Jason, you're the laser guru, so lead us off on this one. So what's interesting about this letter is that these devices are not new. They've been out for a couple of years now. And it's interesting that when they first came out, there was no data behind them at all. But nowadays, since these devices came out, there's a lot of data on efficacy. You know, they were first in the hands of plastic surgeons and dermatologists who probably weren't really able to figure out whether vaginal rejuvenation devices actually were helpful or not. They thought they were good, a lot of anecdotal evidence. But now these devices are in the hands of urogynecologists who actually do these kind of procedures for a living. And I've seen a lot of the data over the last two years. The data is good. John, what, John, what do you think? What's your take? I think when the uh, the FDA looks at this more carefully, they're going to come to a different conclusion. Now, we've had some experience in my practice, and uh, uh, our team members that have been using them have had a high degree of satisfaction from the patients. So, And there's a lot of very knowledgeable people in our own specialty, Dr. Hamori and others, who have huge experience with these and uh, really, I think, are benefiting. I think women have really basically suffered in silence for a long, long time about these uh, issues. They've been reluctant to undergo these big, expensive surgical procedures, and this really offers a tremendous benefit to our patients. Yeah, Dan uh, Del Vecchio, so from the rest area in Massachusetts, this is not the, la the first or last time the FDA will kind of weigh in on things kind of out of the blue, right? These devices are registered with the FDA as wound contraction and scar treatment devices. They are not FDA approved. They don't have a labeled indication to tighten vaginas, treat urinary incontinence. And if you have a website that has a, a product called Mona Lisa or Fem whatever, the FDA is basically doing the right thing. I have no problem with what they did. I applaud the FDA for keeping these aggressive laser companies in check. Charlie, what do you think? Eh? What's, what's the bottom line here? What's your take on this deal? The bottom line is the technology is there and, and there's evidence, histologic evidence and studies that show that these devices can be helpful. But like Dan said, you have to make sure the patients are adequately informed of potential complications, that they're used at the appropriate settings for whatever the gynecologic or vaginal rejuvenation indication it is. And so that way that, that both the physician and, and the patient are, are more adequately uh, informed of what can potentially go wrong so that the patients are getting the appropriate treatment for the appropriate indication. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, the FDA does have a process that needs to go through to get approved for certain things and you just can't haphazardly market something you don't have approval for regardless of the fact that I think Jason and John, your points are, are well taken. I think the overall experience has been very good. So I would, I would say that these companies should be able to submit data to show that, that they're not harming patients and that, that the, the technology works. It's just, I think at this point, they haven't done so. All right, well, let's move on. So I'm a hockey fan. I know you guys are hockey fans. I've actually never heard of a breast implant being ruptured by a hockey puck, but this adult film star apparently had that happen while she was watching a Washington Capitol playoff game. By the way, they won the Stanley Cup. She thinks it's worth it. Charlie, you started off. I mean, how how durable are breast implants? Breast implants are extremely durable, uh, with the leak rates anywhere from from one percent some series as much as eleven percent over over six to ten years. So I, I personally never heard of 
of localized trauma like this, creating a uh, rupture of an implant. The implants are designed to be very durable, and the most time that, that leaking leakage does occur, it's, it's a progressive breakdown of, of the implant surface, which takes years if it happens at all. Don't think that you got this from the puck. John, you're, you're, you're from the, the Mecca of hockey, Chicago Blackhawk land. Now, what do you think? Seems a bit unlikely. Uh, here in Chicago, I've seen plenty of hockey puck injuries, both at the professional and the amateur level. We have a growing number of women here in Chicago who love to play the game, but I've never seen a woman with a, <laughs> playing the game who's had a hockey puck injury, at least to the chest. But I suppose it can happen. The only insight I might have is if, if she was a true hockey fan, she probably would figure that being able to keep the puck was a fair trade for the injury. Jason, you know, th this does come up. I mean, you can have blunt trauma that causes an implant to rupture, but it is very rare. These, these implants that we use today really are, are extremely durable. I mean, you can drive a car over them, right? I agree. The technology we have today far exceeds what we had 10 years ago. But let's make a few assumptions. One, if she noticed the leak, we're going to assume this is a saline implant. If it's a saline implant, most of us are using very few saline implants these days. So I'm going to assume that these implants were placed some time ago. Assumption two. So maybe they are getting to the end of their lifespan. They are 15, maybe they are 15 year old implants or 10 year old implants or whatever else. Then maybe she got hit, but it doesn't sound like based on what Charlie said with no bruising, I don't see how you got a pretty forceful injury. So maybe the timing was just, you know, uh, good timing that the implant ruptured after it was an old implant. Delvecchio, you're a Boston Bruin fan. We're not gonna hold that against you, but uh, what say you about this story? I am highly suspect that this ever happened. If I were a porn star and I got hit in the boob, I would have my boob all over the, the press showing the bruising. Did anyone see the breast? I didn't see it. And she's probably just trying to get some PR. And her PR person said, hey, you're, you're a sports fan. Go to a sports game and make up a story. All right, let's move on to the last story. This comes out of the Aesthetic Surgery Journal. It's about the stress of social media. I mean, social media is all over the place. It's certainly part of plastic surgery in a big way. Charlie, you start us off. What, what, what do you think about this editorial? Well, I, I think that there's been a lot of evidence showing that social media can have a negative impact on someone's self-esteem, especially in young uh, and teenagers. I think for us as plastic surgeons, social media is a good way to reach uh, thousands of patients, millions of patients. In the wrong hands, it, it can it can really make someone feel uh, like less of a person. And, and there is a definite degree of, of competition among certain um, groups of individuals that try to increase the number of likes, increase the number of views. That's what makes us good. We're competitive people. We try to do really good work. We try to take care of our patients. We're perfectionists. So I'm confused by the editorial in and of itself. Sure, if it, if it weren't the internet, we'd be buying $10,000 a month yellow page ads. So we're just trading one form of competition for another. DDV, listen, don't get stressed out, no pun intended. So John, you do some social media in your office and what, what do you think about this topic? Well, I think you have to realize that everybody on social media is wearing a mask. And uh, there, was, there was a group of my colleagues here in Chicago who looked and found that people on uh, one of the social media platforms who were representing themselves as plastic surgeons and doing plastic surgery procedures weren't even board certified plastic surgeons. The, the good news, I think, is that more and more people are aware of this, the more they're gonna discount social media. I, for one, don't pay a whole lot of attention to it, so you know, if you don't make something a stress, it's not going to be personally a stress for you. Yeah, interestingly, you know, the, there was a guy that commented on this that's on the back end of that article. And he, Jason, he was talking about almost like fake social media where people come up with a fake username and then they post, you know, inaccurate, fictitious kind of data up on social media. And he said that's why people get stressed out about it. But what do you think about this? You know, I, I, I kind of read this in two ways. I, I read the stress for us, but I also was thinking about the stress for the patients, and I think they mentioned that as well. So if someone sees a picture on social media and it's unflattering, they get stressed and they want cosmetic surgery. So I think there's definitely people looking at their picture saying, hey, I need some stuff done, just like I got my eyes done because I hated looking at myself on these plastic surgery channel videos. So I was stressed about that. But in terms <laughs> of what we do in the practice, 
I'm over this stuff. We stopped doing Facebook now. Uh, we're doing a little bit of Instagram, but I'm trying to get over this stuff. I hate it. It's it's here to stay whether you like it, Jason, or not. Patients, people, people in the world, the first thing they look at is how many followers does this person have? And they literally judge how good a surgeon is by how many people they have following. I don't think it's right. I'm just telling you that's what they believe. Charlie, you had a comment. Like Dan said, it is definitely here to stay. I think patients are more savvy about reviews and about instant um, social media. So they're taking, some are taking it uh, more with a grain of salt in terms of what they're seeing. And, but it's a definitely a, a great way to reach you know, thousands of people instantaneously. Those are some great insights, guys. I'm sure our viewers really enjoyed it. And if you want to see more of this, you can see it on the plasticsurgerychannel.com.